did William I explode? And who shot William II? My short stories about how our kings and queens met their grisly ends have been really popular on TikTok, so I've brought a bunch of them over here into one long video. I hope they don't start fighting. Enjoy. This one's nice and gruesome. You all loved hearing about how Edward II died, so here's another one for you. This is William I, or William the Conqueror, 21 years after the Battle of Hastings, and he's still out there fighting, and he was actually thrown forward onto the big pommel of his horse's saddle, and it perforated his bowel. But that's not the sort of injury that's going to kill you instantly and he went through five weeks of suffering before he eventually died but that's not the end of the story it took them so long to figure out how they were going to do his funeral and there were lots of disagreements but he was just getting bigger and bigger swelling up after death and when they tried to push him into the coffin his body just exploded all over the place why did william the conqueror explode it's a story we've all heard, but what led to it? When William the Conqueror died in 1087, there was a bit of a panic. Nobody really knew what to do. Nobody decided to stop and take out his intestines and the usual stuff and embalm him. It was decided that he should be taken from Rouen to Cannes eventually. On the way there, the procession had to be stopped because there was this big fire that everyone had to deal with. And then when they got to the monastery at Cannes, there was a protester there who said that he couldn't be buried this land belonged to the protester's father that William had stolen. I mean, he was paid off in the end and it was decided they could bury him. But in the meantime, all the feces and bacteria from his gut had spilled out. All the bacteria had gone to lunch. It was munching on everything, producing gas, burping, farting. And William was just swelling and swelling. When they tried to push his swollen body into the stone coffin, something was going to give and it wasn't going to be the coffin. You guys are all as weird as me. You're loving the stories about how the kings died. It's great. So let's do another one. This is William II. He was the, one of the sons of William the Conqueror and he was the second king of England since 1066. So William, also known as William Rufus because of his red face, he was out in the woods hunting, hunting stag. And uh, one of the arrows that was meant for the stag ended up in William's chest. Now it's a sort of injury that could kill you instantly or it could linger. He managed to break off the arrow but fell on the injury and hurt himself in the end anyway. His companions found him dead and they ran away. They were later blamed for his death and the question was, was the arrow ever meant for the stag or was it meant for William himself? Because it was suggested that William's brother Henry, who very quickly became Henry I, had assassinated his brother. So there you go, that was the end of William II. Uh, there's, there's loads more where that came from. <laughs> Stick around. Well, you clearly love all the body and burial chats, TikTok. So here's another one. This is what happened to the body of James IV of Scotland. James IV died at the Battle of Flodden in 1513 and initially his body was taken to Berwick. There it was embalmed and put in a coffin and it was sent down to Sheen Priory near London. A decision had to be made because there was a problem with his body. He'd been excommunicated from the church, so he couldn't just be simply buried. Henry VIII had to go to the Pope to ask permission. He did get it, but nobody ever got round to burying James IV. His body lay in a storeroom in Sheen Priory for over 50 years. It just dried up and the head fell off. Some people kicked it about a bit and then decided they should probably bury it. So it was buried at the Church of St. Michael at Wood Street in London. The head, I mean, I have no idea what happened to the body. You wanted more king deaths, so here you go, here's another one. Here's Henry I. So Henry I was the third king of England since 1066. William the Conqueror was his father. He was over in France when he ate too many of these lampreys. He ate and ate and ate until he got food poisoning and became really unwell. Lampreys are an eel-like fish, sort of funny looking things with, with these teeth. They look a bit grim, but apparently, according to Henry I, they tasted quite nice and he had too many of them. Do we believe this story? Well... We don't know. The chroniclers and monks of the time, they had just as much reason to confabulate and outright lie as our tabloids do today. But these sort of things, they make for really good stories. Alex Griffin 59, thank you for the question. I don't think it's my favourite, but I am a little bit obsessed with this guy and how he died. This is James V of Scotland. Previous Stuart kings had been dying in battle, but he died because of a battle that he wasn't even at. 
In November 1542, his forces lost the Battle of Solway Moss against the English, and when King James heard about it, he collapsed, and by the 14th of December of that year, he was dead. And it went down in history that he died of a broken heart. Now, historians since then have said, oh, it must have been cholera or dysentery, because that can't happen. But maybe they don't know that you can actually die of a broken heart. There's a condition called Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, where a huge insult from a sudden release of stress hormones can actually have an effect on part of the heart, rendering it unable to bl pump blood and function, leading to heart failure. So it is actually entirely possible that James V of Scotland died of a broken heart, and that's what I would have written on his death certificate. The death of Edmund Ironside was pretty grim, and quite smelly. So Edmund II of England, he, on the 30th of November in 1016, had a call of nature. I mean, even kings need to poop. So off he went to the toilet, he lifted up his kingly robes, he sat down, he got out his phone, he opened TikTok, and then it happened. His murderer had been waiting in the toilet pit, waiting for the moment that Edmund's big bare bum would come down towards him. And when it did, he thrust up a dagger, killing the king. I mean, you know, do we really know what happened 900 years ago? No. But what I really want to know is how on earth did his murderer know that that was the bare arse of King Edmund coming down towards him? I mean, had he seen it before? Who knows? And what's really interesting is that there are at least two other European monarchs who are said to have died in this quite smelly way. Definitely on my list of good king deaths is James II of Scotland. He died on the 3rd of August in 1460 and he was only a young man, he was 29 years old. And James was known as having a really fiery temperament, he wasn't very nice, think King Joffrey, Game of Thrones. He had seen murder and treachery growing up. He even murdered his own childhood friend, the Earl of Douglas. There were ongoing feuds with the Douglases for power in Scotland, but also feuds with the English as well. And it was Roxburgh Castle that was being held by the English that they laid siege to in the 1460. Now, Joff Joffrey, Joffrey, <laughs> James, <laughs> King James II was there and he was standing next to his prized cannon. He was really into artillery and he ordered it fired and there was something went wrong. There was a massive explosion and it was described as snapping his thigh in two. And you can survive an injury like that if you can stop the bleeding, then you won't exsanguinate, bleed to death. But he died really quickly. So that's what happened to James. <laughs> You guys really want the death of Queen Victoria, so let's do it. There were no arrows in the eye or daggers up the bum for Queen Victoria. She lived to the age of 80 and spent most of her life in pretty good health, despite a couple of illnesses, you know, obesity and a prolapse and nine children. And Anyway, her mother was an early adopter of the smallpox vaccination, so she had it as a youngster, but she also had no exposure to other children and other childhood diseases. She came to reign at the age of 18 and reigned for 64 years, 40 of those without her husband Albert, who maybe died of typhoid, but that's for another video. During her reign, medicine became more of a science, thought of as more of a science, more experimentation, more documentation. But for Queen Victoria, despite really dodgy family genetics, she did quite well. She faded away in the end. It was put down as aged senility. There was heart failure like her uncle William IV, perhaps a cerebral hemorrhage, and despite her age and all that, still took everyone by surprise. Time for the death of Richard III. You guys have been asking, we got here in the end. Until recently, we wouldn't even have been able to make this video like this, because Richard III's body, nobody knew where it was. He was the only monarch since William the Conqueror whose body was unaccounted for. We know that he died at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485, and we know that his death was traumatic and by that I mean caused by physical trauma, but that's all we knew. Until in 2012 when some amazing researchers from Leicester unearthed Richard III's body famously under a car park, which was the site of a Grey Fires church, hence the burial. What they were able to do then was analyse the bones, carbon dating, CT scanning, DNA analysis, all to not only say that this was the body of Richard III, but also to look really closely at the injuries that you could see on the bones and figure out how he died. Those injuries I'm going to detail in part two. The death of Richard III then, part two. When the researchers laid out the body of Richard III and examined the bones, they were able to see 11 distinct different injuries where evidence had been left on the bones. Nine of them were to the head and two of those likely to be fatal blows. One of them was a sharp, large, sharp forced trauma to the base, the inferior aspect of the skull it had gone right through, right through the brain and had even left a mark on the underside of the skull on the other side. The other, a penetrating injury from a sharp edged sword, perhaps. 
Richard III had been surrounded by Tudor supporters. He'd been cut down and he was hit multiple times in the head with multiple injuries. He was likely to be on his knees, leaning forward or in a prone position. There was no horse. And he was very unlikely to have been wearing a helmet to have had those injuries inflicted. Those things have been talked about a lot. It's really nice to see that sort of evidence. You can read it for yourself in The Lancet. I think it's 2014. It's really worth a, worth a look. I find the death of Mary I quite emotive. I'm not sure why. She died on the 17th of November in 1558 during the flu epidemic. It could have been that, but that was on a background of something probably ovarian that plagued her since puberty. And she was the daughter of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon. She was in favour, out of favour, and eventually she became queen when her half-brother died. She married quite late to Philip of Spain and she was desperate for children. So when changes started to happen, there was rejoicing. Her abdomen started to swell. She was amenorrheic, which meant no menstrual periods. Then the baby didn't come. We got our dates wrong, the doctor said, but the baby still didn't come and the swelling subsided. She wasn't pregnant. And this happened a couple of times and then she became really unwell. In 2000, a doctor called Milo Keynes suggested that this could be a pituitary tumour, a prolactinoma. It screws up with your hormones and really could explain all of her symptoms, including the phantom pregnancy. Clever chap. The death of Queen Anne, of course we can, because it's proper medically geeky history stuff, this. If you've ever seen any episode of House, you'll know that the answer is never, ever, ever, ever lupus. Except with Queen Anne, it might well have been lupus. Lupus is an autoimmune condition where the immune system of the body creates antibodies. It's triggered to create antibodies against parts of itself and starts invading as if there are foreign bodies about. It causes lots of problems and a specific set of symptoms. For Queen Anne, she was obese, she suffered with gout, she had a skin condition, she had dry eyes, she had poor eyesight as well. She had attacks of polyarthritis, she had swelling in her legs, it's really hard to squeeze Anne into 60 seconds. It's gonna, it's gonna be hard to squeeze Anne into anything. She was huge because of her illness. And nobody really knew what was going on. We didn't recognize lupus autoantibodies until like 1975, something like that. Anyway, Queen Anne's death, it's gonna need a part two. The death of Queen Anne then, part two. Queen Anne was in a terrible state of health her whole life and it wasn't helped by the fact that she had 17 pregnancies. Some of them miscarried, some of them were stillborn, some of them died in infancy. There was one lad who did survive, but he only made it to the age of 11. So Anne was left without an heir. Parliament were in no mood for the return of Catholics to the throne, remembering that she was the daughter of James II. So that all led to George I and the Hanoverians. But we're not talking about that, we're talking about her death. Queen Anne fell ill in August of 1714. Like, really fell ill. I mean, she'd been ill before, but this was bad. She was really in a lot of pain in her legs. She was all swollen. She was in a horrible state, and the physicians, they couldn't put a name to it. What they did do was try what they had tried with her uncle, Charles II. Really torturous, horrible ending for her. And it didn't work. Again. So that was the end of Anne and the Stuarts. And I didn't even mention Sarah Churchill. When Queen Anne died, she'd had a series of strokes on the background of an illness that she'd had her whole life, which was causing multiple problems. We alluded to lupus or some autoimmune condition in the previous videos. I think there might have been a clot going on which caused strokes. She'd been complaining of pain in her legs in the, in the days before her death. For Queen Anne, the same thing happened to her that happened to Charles II, her uncle. He'd had a stroke and was on his deathbed for days. And the two of them, well, their physicians tried everything they could think of, really. They tried bleeding, which we come across quite a lot, but cupping as well, brazing blisters on the skin. They applied red hot irons to her feet and garlic. Garlic to her feet, not red hot irons to the garlic. Prin Prince Charles? No, <laughs> not Prince Charles. Charles II sat up and apologised at one point for taking so long to die. I wonder if he might have been apologising to himself at that point. I made a video about that. I'll repost it. It was ages ago, so I'll repost it after this one.